Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to react to Western Scholar Accidentally Proves Quran's Author is Not Human. So lately we've seen plenty of Western scholars finally coming around and confirming what we as Muslims already know. Guys, before we start the video, as always, leave me a thumbs up if you like the content and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. With no further ado, let's have a look. Secular Quran academics claim the Arabic Quran is not divine, but a cultural product of the Arabs, written by an Arab or Arabs somewhere in or around Arabia. The culture that produced the other great cultural product of the Arabs, Jahili poetry, also known as the Diwan al-Arab, archive of the Arabs, must have also produced the Quran. It's just common sense. If the source of both are the same, i.e. Exactly right. The idea is that the Quran is simply a poetic work of the Arabs, no difference to the other works prior to the Quran. The Arab that culture. That is the secular claim. Surely the ontological worldview observed in the pre-Islamic poetry would be mirrored in the Quran, since much of the finest Arabic poetry was written in the preceding 6th century and in parallel with the Quran in the 7th. We ought to see a significant thematic overlap. That's just obvious. Evidence of sure. conceptual borrowing between poetry and the Quran would indicate a common human origin, namely the cultural milieu of the Arabs. Therefore, the Quran isn't divine, but of human origin. So, That's the what's the truth? Brothers and sisters, highly acclaimed secular professor Angelica Neweth, whom I've introduced you to in a previous video, will now demonstrate whether we find this historic literary and philosophical convergence. The professor is a world-leading German Islamic studies scholar and Professor of Quranic Studies at Frey University in Berlin, also a visiting professor at the University of Jordan in Amman. Her research focuses on Quran studies, classical and modern Arabic literature, Arab late antiquity studies. She has taught at the universities of Munich, Amman, Bamberg and Cairo. Ideas put forward in these texts is, however, limited That's to a their big German accent, uh, particular milieu which can be captured that. through an equally limited scope of literary genres. It's not at all surprising that the 6th century Arabs were interested in writing poetry about their immediate desert environment. Here are Makes the sense. themes and genres we find in their writings. Rock inscriptions, they are extremely short and mostly dedicated to private, mostly ephemeral issues. The content of the other great source of early Arabic writing, rock inscriptions, are of the same intimate kind. Love, sickness, death, and longing. So the human appears ultimately, that's what they say. The total absence of discursive speech. There are no theological, legal, or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced. If we do not concede one important exception. There is arguably a serious philosophical interest lurking in the Nasib. I'm going to underline this because it's important. Remember, she's describing pre-Islamic poetry here. Quote, the almost total absence of discursive speech. There are no theological, legal or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced. This she will next compare with the Qur'an. If you would just use common sense and you discard your preconceived notions, you simply look objectively at the situation. The Qur'an must have been extremely different to anything preceding it. Why else would the Arabs be so impressed with it? Through the Qur'an, through Islam, the Arabs got united. So this book must have had a powerful impact on those people. And if that is the case, which it is of course, then you have to wonder why. And the answer is that the Quran was extremely different to any poetry prior to it. A book Obviously. produced, supposedly, by the same ethno-linguistic group. Exactly. It's a striking Doesn't fact work. then that the Quran appears seemingly, seemingly out of the void as a full-fledged discursive text, extensive in range and replete with theological and philosophical queries. So a complete 180. 
Where the poetry lacks these significant literary characteristics, the Qur'an is, quote, replete with theological and philosophical queries. So it's not surprising that... This observation has been... And I have to interrupt it here yet again because it is so extremely powerful. We're talking about the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula that used to be pagans. So their poetry has no theological discussion whatsoever. But now comes the Quran, the message of Tawheed, pure monotheism. This is the first time that we see theological implementation in any type of text in the Arabian Peninsula. So therefore, yet again, the Quran clearly stands out. Vexing. And that's what the scientist here says Western as well. Western scholars for generations. The Quran's surprising richness of ideas and its consummate form. The striking disparity between the rudimentary Arabic poetry on the one hand and the richness of the Arabic Quran on the other, in terms of its intellectual sophistication, is for academics understandably quite vexing. But recall, Angelica Newith made an exception with the Naseeb. Now, this is where it gets deep and really interesting. I would actually rewind to this text here and read further because here she says, how can an intellectually sophisticated literary text emerge from a remote place like the Arab Peninsula? So you can clearly see that the German scholar here admits that the Quran is completely different to anything else prior to it. And moreover, it makes her wonder how it could emerge in such a remote place. The Nasib, the poet's nostalgic lament on the site of the ruined encampment where he remembers a happy past in the company of his friends and his mistress. The Nasib is uniquely open to poetical introspection. Angelica Newith is describing the introductory Nasib of the poems which are famously sad and always conjure the image of a ruined Bedouin encampment. The poet laments a happy but lost past with friends and the departure of his beloved. The message of the Nasib is always, love and happiness is fleeting. Man is helpless before his fate. It is also in the Naseeb. The poet will often introduce the audience to what should be a very familiar word to all Muslims, wahi, which in the poems is deployed as a powerful metaphor. In the context of Jahili poetry, it refers to a nonverbal sign or inexplicable graffiti on a desert rock. And shapes in the poet's eyes represent not a valid sign system, uh, but an empty signifier, reflecting the devastated states, uh, state of the poet's past, of his encampment, which is erased to the ground. And writing, then, represented by wahi in pre-Islamic poetry, is a kind of shorthand sign for the negation of the validity and relevance of Muruwa, the Bedouin world view. Okay, so there's a lot to take in. Let's break it down. In these Jahili poems, the opening, the Naseeb, is always the same. The persona in the poem is observing a wahi, an enigmatic sign on rock, and feeling a profound despair. These mysterious graffiti represent the obliterated past and leave the poet feeling confused and pessimistic about his present and future existence. Symbolising, uh, quote, the permanence of nature and the impermanence of culture. The poetic wahi, i.e. the confusing rock inscriptions, represent an existential crisis facing the Bedouin. This is the disconcerting worldview of the pre-Islamic Arabs. Life is pointless, for all good things perish. It is also more striking and spring than to find that this wahi of loss, a wahi that remains mute, has been inverted in the Quranic lexicon Wahi in the Qur'an denotes inspiration. It even successively acquires the meaning of revelation, ayat, signs, epistemic tools that disclose to the listener the hidden significance of his surrounding. The mute and foreboding wahi of poetry that left the poet depressed, signifying pessimism, has literally been flipped 180 in the Qur'an. The term wahi in the Qur'an is no longer a perplexing graffiti that throws the poet headlong into aporia. The negative wahi now signifies a positive sign, a revelation, 
inspiration. And this makes perfect sense because before Islam you have many forms of paganism. Ultimately you do not have the worship of one God and we as Muslims know of course if we are not worshiping God we are gonna get depressed and therefore you see it in the poetry as well. If you do not worship God you will automatically fall into nihilism and this is why the poetry was nihilistic. They saw no meaning in their life. Quite the opposite everything was meaningless but with this revelation, with the Quran, with the return to worshiping one God alone, we find meaning in our life, and this is why it is flipped 180. Subhanallah. It's quite so instead of the Wahi mystifying life, the Quranic Wahi re enchants it by literally exactly. and symbolically descending as a revelation to unveil the secrets That's the good of news. the universe. This reimagined Wahi rouses in the once beleaguered poet a newfound vitality and a sense of personal meaning for the arc of life. Exactly right. It is this perception Return to of meaning. the world That's it. that the Quran That's what the human being needs. God himself takes over the role of fate and reshapes the time of men, which now is no longer cyclical but expands from primordial creation to its end on judgment day. The Bedouin exactly world right. is turned on its head. What was once willful fate annihilating culture and rampaging through civilization in poetry is replaced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Yes, yet again it brings back meaning. It gives you a structure, a linear timeline from the beginning till the end, till the end of days so to speak. However within the pagan worldview you did not have that linear progression. Quite the opposite. What you had was randomness and this is why I say in this day and age we are pagans as well. The majority of this society is absolutely pagan. They might not worship Thor, the god of thunder or whatnot, however they worship their own desires. They worship anything but God, be it sexual immorality, be it parties, drugs or whatnot. They are worshipping anything but God and therefore this is polytheism, hence it is paganism and moreover this is why the whole claim of this society is that everything is random, right? Atheism tells you that there is absolutely no purpose to life, everything is randomly evolved and now we are here. Yesterday monkeys, today humans. As a Muslim is now able it's to shape his same. fate through the intentional act of worship and ritual dedication, deaf and mute fate which doesn't respond to anybody has been displaced by a listening and benevolent God. Death is no longer the end of everything you savor, what you do in life is judged and it determines your after life. You now have the promise of eternal bliss to help you find meaning in this life. Ultimately, the anthropocentric worldview has been displaced by a theocentric one. The individualistic, heroic, wine-drinking hedonism of yes. Jahiliya has been supplanted by a God-centered theological system that now values discipline and personal accountability held inside a profound covenantal bond reaching into the annals of history. The Quran. Yes, and we see that throughout all the societies, every time the societies fall into hedonism, into nihilism, they're degenerates, they're drinking, they have prostitution and whatnot, they are falling. And after that, they're being replaced by theocracies. The theocratic system is always superior to the nihilistic system. However, unfortunately, people do not see it. And because people do not see it, they will suffer. It doesn't just hail a new moral vision and thereby an existential break from the past. It initiates a paradigm shift by directly challenging and turning the old ontological assumptions on their head. It's one thing to chart a new course, but to say to an entire civilization everything they knew for a thousand years is wrong and the opposite is true yeah. and the brazen way Allah does so is just an astounding feat. Let's now get to the heart. And I mean of it's absolutely no wonder of course that the Arabs with Islam came to success because this ideology prior to Islam is an ideology of despair, whining about existence, crying about your own misery. But with Islam it is quite the opposite. The Adan calls us to come to success, come to prayer, come to success. Of course this will lead then this society to succeed. It is very simple. Video. Are the people and culture who produced the Jali poetry also responsible for the 7th century Quran, therefore both are of human origin? The answer is a resounding no. Impossible. Frankly, the worldview in the poetry and the Quran are diametrically opposed. In summary, the Quran has a positive message of hope. The signs and world reveal the purpose of life. You shape your own life. A final judgment. Your actions inform. An afterlife that depends on your actions. Whereas the pre-Islamic poetry has 
a depressing message of a pointless life. Signs on rocks are mute and confusing. Non-negotiable fate and not God controls life. No final judgment, no afterlife. So yeah. on account of this strong conceptual Pure animosity, the it. only reasonable conclusion is the Qur'an could not have been a product of the Qasida producing Arabs. It means that the Qur'an comes as a sudden disclosure in Arabic language of until then unspoken of or at least unattested discursive ideas. I propose to read the Qur'an as nothing less than the document of a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution. With she words like it. sudden disclosure, unattested, until then unspoken, a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution, there is no doubt in Angelica Newith's mind the writing of the pre-Islamic Arabs and the writing in the Qur'an cannot be compared. Okay, no. so, if the masters of the Arabic lexicon didn't write the ultimate literary masterpiece in Arabic, the Qur'an, who on earth did? Must have been a foreigner then, right? All right, and this is it for today's video. As I said in previous Western videos, we as Muslims do not need this confirmation. However, for the West, this is of course important. It is always kind of funny for me personally to see that even though this scientist, this scholar clearly sees that the Quran is completely different than anything previously, they still have to discard it as some human invention after all. So who was it then? In the end, I joked, how oh, must have been a foreigner. Then, right? If the Arabs were not capable of writing anything of those sorts, who wrote the Quran? We as Muslims, of course, believe that it comes straight from Allah, that it comes from God. But even if you want to take this humanistic approach after all here, you have to ask yourself the question, why is the theological worldview, the theological worldview of worshipping one God, so extremely superior to the nihilistic one? What is it truly? If there is no God whatsoever, and this book has been created by a mere human. Why does it lead to such positive outcomes? What is it in that book that leads to positive outcomes? What is so transformative about this book? How can the thought of an afterlife, how can the thought of an ultimate judgment of an all-powerful being lead to a better life if there is absolutely no God whatsoever and we are just random evolutions? Why would that lead to a positive outcome? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Ever. If we just evolved, then the only thing that matters is survival of the fittest. All I have to worry about is eating and having sex. That's it. I don't have to worry about society. I don't have to worry about family. I don't have to worry about love, philosophy, spirituality, none of those sorts. So why, yet again, is the message of one God at all considered positive for us? Why do we experience this relief? Why do we experience this shift from nihilism, a depressed state, into a state of joy, happiness, hopefulness when we envision that there is a God that judges us. That is totally counterintuitive, yet again, evolutionary speaking, it wouldn't make you happy at all if there was somebody judging you. But for the believer, this brings back meaning in life, and this is what it boils down to. The human being needs meaning. We see that over and over again. We're not just a monkey that cares about food and sex. No, we care about meaning. We are questioning things. And every single time we are lacking meaning in our life, we get depressed. Even the atheist finds meaning in his life by saying there is no God. And he finds meaning somewhere else, be it in science, be it in art, be it in what not. But everybody is looking for that meaning. Unfortunately, nowadays people tell us that there is no meaning in life. And they tell us that there is no right and wrong. There is no truth. There is no objective morality. And we can do whatever we want. We have this monkey body, we have this absolute animal body, and we can follow its urges. Whatever feels good is automatically right. When we are hungry, we can order on Uber Eats, and if we want to have sex, we can go on Tinder. Just pleasure ourselves until we die, because nothing really matters. My heart goes out, however, to the deceived people. And guess what? I was one of them as well. I was in Jehelia. I was there myself. I was dating, I was partying, I was drinking. I was doing drugs. I was doing all of those things because I didn't know any better. I was severely depressed apparently without even seeing it. I thought I'm just
just having fun. I, however, by the grace of God, got out of it. Alhamdulillah. But I see so many people being trapped in it. So many women that find themselves now in their 30s sexually traumatized and not able to form a meaningful relationship. Those women are damaged goods. And again, my heart goes out to them because they fell victim to the promotion of feminism, liberalism, etc., etc. You go, girl, have fun. And now they're absolutely destroyed. And this happens if you remove God from society. Once you remove God from society, you surely will have a depressed life. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon or by getting merch, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.